walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence I know the night won't last Your word will come to pass My heart will sing your praise again Jesus, you're still enough So keep me within your love my heart will sing your praise again. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never Your promise still stands, great is your faithfulness, faithfulness, I'm still in your hands, this is my confidence, you've never failed me yet. I've seen you move, you move the mountains, and I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way when there was no way, and I believe I'll see you do it again. I've seen you move, you move the mountains, and I believe I'll see you do you made a way when there was no way and I believe I'll see you do it again I've seen you move you move the mountains and I believe I'll see you do it again you made a way when there was no way and I believe I'll see you Your promise still stands, great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands, this is my confidence, you never failed me yet. I never will forget that you never ever failed me yet. Thank you, Lord. You're true to your promise. You never, ever failed me yet. I trust you, God. I never will forget that you never, ever failed me yet. I never will forget that you 
never failed me Yo. Yo. 
Here's what's going on this week at ALCF. Make plans to join us for If My People, our special monthly multi-church live stream gathering as we fast and pray together with over 30 churches represented across the Bay Area. Log on to the TBC Cities Facebook page on Wednesday, September 9th from 12 to 12.30 p.m. when we'll seek the heart of God together for justice and healing with one heart, one voice, and as one church. In our next women's Bible study, which focuses on Elijah, author Douglas Connolly helps you to look beyond the insecurity of the world and instead to focus on our sovereign God who reigns forever. These eight session Zoom events take place on Wednesdays starting September 16th through November 11th from 7 to 8.15 p.m. I'm Pam Eves, and I'm very excited to announce that we are launching our new season of Mom's Time Out on Thursday, September 10th at 10 o'clock via Zoom. If you're a mom with kids at home of any age, littles to teens, Mom's Time Out is a place for you to gather with other moms for worship and connection and a devotional that's brought to us by a special guest speaker each time we gather, and then some smaller group sharing time in breakout sessions that are led by our wonderful mentor moms who will encourage you and pray for you. Our theme is going to be choosing to rest in God's promises, and we will focus each time we meet on one of the many ways that we can be strengthened and sustained and refreshed and filled by pressing into God's very personal love for us and His faithfulness. So you can find all the information you need to join us via Zoom on the church website, or you can email me at mto underscore admin at alcf.net. We would love to see you. To stay connected with these and other groups in the ALCF community, go to alcf.net forward slash Zoom. Abundant life exists to make a better you for a better world. Good morning, everyone. My name is Margie Fennell, and I have been a member of ALCF, I would say, probably for about 10, maybe 12 years. And uh, I have something on my heart I'd like to share with you this morning. Uh, and it has to do with uh, corporate worship. I have a friend of mine, and we were talking and praying together on Tuesday morning, and she shared with me how deep um, that she just so yearns uh, to be with the body uh, in corporate worship. And uh, it's a very deep yearning, a uh, deep desire. And I know I've heard others share that too, like they really miss um, the fellowship, uh, the worship. And it was then that the Lord helped me to understand that her deep desire was actually his deep desire. It's his desire in her. And um, that just got me to thinking. And there's a scripture that he would think with that kind of a deep intensity, desiring, um, kind of like our presence. And uh, the scripture in Luke twenty two fourteen, 14, where he said to his apostles, he said, I have desired with desire to eat this Passover with you. And uh, in that thought, um, it's this forget this togetherness it involves not just us getting together but it's him and us together and uh there's a deeper in that in that kind of togetherness where there's a deeper and more intimate encounter with him it happens when we are together uh uh it's that kind of fellowship that blesses and delights his heart and so he earnestly, the desire that he has within him is actually for intimacy with us. And that word intimacy uh, for me means into me see. And he yearns uh, that we can see into him, that we can see him. And so he cares for us uh, with the deepest thoughts of intimacy. So as I think about that, um, then I wonder, well, where's the application? considering where we are today with all the upheaval that's going on around us. And uh, the thought that came to me is that what it does for me, uh, his desire for corporate worship, it assures me that nothing will be lost. And also, uh, because nothing will be lost, that his love and his care for me uh, not only endures, but it continues and it's forever and ever and ever. And uh, I pray that this thought is as, as encouraging to you as it was to me. And so with that, um, I'd like to uh, pray a prayer, a short prayer, and uh, then we'll be ready to uh, hear from Pastor Gary. 
And so, Lord, uh, I thank you, Father, uh, our hearts together, Father, um, those who are listening. Uh, Father, we thank you so much, Father, for your love for us and Lord Jesus, for your desire, that you desire with desire uh, for us to um, step with you, to commune you with you, uh, to see into you, to know you. And uh, I pray that your desire within us would continue to increase and would continue to bring us in uh, to a place of worship before you. And I pray that our eyes and our hearts will be opened as we continue in our service this morning. And I thank you for your blessing and your grace uh, in intimacy. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to church. Good morning and welcome to church. We're the Andersons. My name is Gary, and I have the privilege of serving as a pastor here at Abundant Life Christian Fellowship, and we are so glad that you are able to join with us this morning for our virtual church service. Uh, I have just a few quick announcements before we get to our giving. Uh, the first is this is a communion service, so if you need to get the elements now, please do so, and we'll take communion together uh, after the sermon. The second is this. We have some exciting new developments for ways that we can engage this fall, and uh, I want to make sure that you're aware of them as early as possible. The first is that we are going to do some worship and prayer nights uh, on Zoom through the fall. The first one is going to be on September 18th, so that's uh, a little bit less than two weeks away. Uh, we'll have worship and prayer from 7 to 8 o'clock that Friday night. Would love for you to join us for that. The other uh, exciting announcement is this. Starting in October, on Communion Sundays, we are going to start offering a drive-in communion service on Sunday afternoons. We're going to do it in our parking lot at the church. We've been working on this for a while, and we are very confident we can do it uh, while still holding to all of the guidelines set forth by the county and the state. Uh, we will get more information to you in the coming weeks. We'll have you register ahead of time. We'll stay in cars, all that stuff. Uh, we'll still take communion together in the morning service, but we're going to offer an option to actually do it in person uh, in those afternoons. So again, stay tuned for more information on that. Uh, the final announcement is that we are going to be blessed this morning by a sermon from our very own elder, Keith Richardson. Uh, I'm excited for what God has put on his heart, and I know all of us will be blessed uh, to hear from him as well. And then I'll come back after his sermon to lead us in communion. Now, let's continue our worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings. Will you say the words on your screen with us? That the, the point, point is this. Is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Amen. Abundant life, it's time to give. You can do so online via our app, or you can get your gift to our offices at the church at 2440 Leghorn Street in Mountain View. We'll now head to our time of meet and greet, and then Elder Keith will be back with the sermon. Good morning, Abundant Life. I'm Elder Keith, and I'm bringing today's message. It's an honor and a privilege for me to be able to um, open up the Word of God with you this morning. Uh, my text will be taken out of Matthew uh, 6, uh, 9 and 10, a very familiar um, passage to all of us. Uh, so turn your Bibles there. And the title of this message today is Citizens of the Kingdom of God. So as you turn in there, I'd just like to make a couple of um, thank yous and announcements um, and gratitudes um, on behalf of the elders. Uh, we are so grateful to our staff and their dedication and how ministry is continuing to thrive even in this um, turbulent time that we're living in under COVID-19 restrictions. Um, I know we've all been patient. We can't come to this brick and mortar at Leghorn, but as Pastor Gary said, we're still gathering and uh, enjoying the word of God 
Um, so we just are so grateful to our staff. And we want to say a, a thank you uh, and your continued love for ALCF. You continue to work as unto the Lord. I also want to thank um, our praise team. Uh, every Sunday uh, through Mike, we have Kimrel and Caroline and Julian. Uh, every Sunday, just worshiping and praising the Lord and ushering his presence into our homes every Sunday. And so Mike and uh, the praise team, we just want to give a big shout out to you and a great thanks for your dedication and your love for worship. It goes unnoticed. Lastly, um, I also want to give a big shout out. If you haven't heard, uh, last week the elders made an announcement that Pastor Gary has accepted the role as uh, the lead pastor here at ALCF. And so we are so excited that him and Beth has decided uh, to make this their home in this season and to be our lead shepherd and our lead pastor. And so if you haven't um, thanked him, and this is your first time hearing about it, um, let's just praise God together. And um, once we just um, saturate his email box with love and appreciation, I'm sorry, Gary, let's saturate it to where we need to call IT and it crashed. <laughs> oh, I would love if that happened. Um, so anyway, those are the things that I wanted to say. I know we are living in some unprecedented times, um, but we still serve a God who sits on the throne. Um, with that, let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We know they're new every morning. We do not take for granted your loving kindness towards us. We thank you for who you are and who you are to us. And I pray that as we open up your word, I pray that this message will resonate in our hearts and that it will edify us and that it will build us up in Christ and ultimately that you will be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 6, 9 through 10. It just simply says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. Again, the, the message, the title is Citizens of the Kingdom of God. We are going through turbulent times, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we have never seen um, in our lifetime uh, a global pandemic that has shut down the entire world. And we see as uh, devastating effects with um, hundreds of thousands of people dying because of this disease. It has affected us economically. It has affected how we have done, uh, how we do life and how we've been doing life now. Um, and to add to this pandemic, you um, have civil unrest going on. Uh, racism has continued to um, be a dark cloud over America, be a dark mark on the soul of America. And so we have, uh, demonstrations in cities because of police brutality. People of all nationalities and all religions and all faiths are out there marching for justice. And then it's, if that was not enough, um, this pandemic has caused, caused over 51 million Americans uh, to lose their jobs. And so now you have the threat of people uh, losing their homes or being kicked out of their apartments because they can't afford rent and uh, praise God that the government has subsidized some of that, that hurt, but 51 million Americans without work. Who would have thought that this would have happened at the beginning of uh, the year, January of 2020? None of us would have thought that we would be going through this, these dire circumstances that uh, we are now faced with. We also um, look at how the earth is groaning. Um, if that wasn't enough, civil unrest, um, economic crisis, and uh, a global deadly pandemic. Um, the earth is groaning with us with earthquakes and fires and hurricanes. Um, people are losing their homes through these natural, natural disasters. And so I think it's very fitting for me that um, Pastor Gary this summer has opened up in a series called um, A Church on a Mission. And before that, he took us through the book of Colossians. Um, and one of the key points that came out of that was that Christ changes everything. That was uh, in the June time frame, And then he moved forward with this um, great series that we're in. And um, I'm really grateful for it because just like um, our world has changed um, in the, 
we're now focusing on just the essentials in life. We don't get to um, travel like we used to and go to restaurants and vacations. And so we're just bear down, we're shut down to the bare essentials. And that's what um, this message has done for me. It has made me reflect on the bare essentials of what really matters in the kingdom of God. You know, when you look at um, the uh, humanism worldview, what you find is that in humanism, the philosophy is faith in men, whereas in theism, uh, the philosophy is a faith in God and God alone. Uh, humanism puts man at the forefront, whereas theism, the study of God, and for Christians, let's just be more specific, the study of the one true God puts God in his rightful place as having uh, sovereign and authority and rule over his kingdom. And that's what I want to focus on today. Um, I look at um, the condition of our country, and then I look at the state of uh, the body of Christ at the same time. Like, what should really be our call? Uh, what is Gary talking about when he talks about discipleship? What is the aftermath of that? And when I mean aftermath, that's not even a good term. Uh, what is the, how do we practically affect this world that we live in? Um, we, we look at our government, and our government cannot still solve the problems of social decay, uh, poverty, um, the race uh, issue. Uh, laws are good. Uh, laws have helped my culture um, get access to things that my forefathers couldn't have access to, but it has not changed the heart of man. We look at our education system. Uh, we are in the 21st century, and we are more educated than any generation that ever existed, and yet that hasn't changed the heart of man. Uh, we look at technology, and here we are in the Silicon Valley in the epic center of technology, and technology have done wonderful things. I'm speaking to you right now through Zoom, and um, hundreds of voices will be able to hear this message. And yet, uh, technology hasn't changed the heart of men. Uh, and so what is the real problem? You know, when I look at the story of, um, John, uh, when I look at John 3 and the story of Nicodemus, I, I love that story and I can relate to Nicodemus so well. Uh, Nicodemus in that story, um, he came to Jesus by night. Um, he knew that Jesus was no ordinary man. He even said, the signs and the miracles and the wonders that I see you doing, no one can do it unless God's hand is on him. You are, you are something different. Yet he did not look at him as the son of God at that time. What I like about Nicodemus is that Nicodemus was a Jew. He was part of the nation of Israel, God's chosen people in the old covenant by his physical birth. And yet when Nicodemus came to Jesus, he was also part of a culture that was oppressed by the Roman government and the people of Rome. And I can relate to that as an African-American. My culture can relate to that. Uh, we, came in, we came to America, uh, one of the few immigrants that came by force, um, not by choice. Um, and I don't wanna go over the horrific things that my culture had to endure um, but we know them. We know enduring slavery and being dehumanized and going through the Jim Crow system and the civil rights movement. And you notice that that generational curse of racism is still exists and that darkness of sin still has retributions that we are still discovering today. And so this is why I can relate to Nicodemus. He was part of a culture that was oppressed. Um, his people had been enslaved by Egypt and they were delivered out of slavery. And yet he was... Uh, promise that there would be a messiah and there would be a new kingdom and so he's looking at jesus and he's saying now look i'm, I'm all these problems are people are oppressed and i'm excited jesus said you are a man of uh of education and you're you're a learned man you have a lot of knowledge see uh, um, uh, nicodemus and so he comes to jesus privately probably excited that if this is the messiah we're getting ready to overthrow this kingdom and yet Jesus says, you come to me and you are coming to me for teaching. Uh, and I wanna paraphrase what he said, which I love so much. Uh, Jesus said to Nicodemus, uh, you have come to me for teaching, but what you have really need is to be born again. You must be born 
from above. Otherwise, you can never see the kingdom of God. I, I wonder how confusing that was to him. I mean, he actually even asked the question, what do you mean born again? How can a man enter his mother's womb? Great question. Like, I don't understand that. But look how pointed Jesus' words were. Unless you are born again, you can never see the kingdom of God. And I just talked about the kingdom of God, that his will be done in heaven as it is on earth when we were reading um, today's text. I think I would have been a little frustrated because, you know, I, I thought, you know, that we were going to overthrow this Roman government, Jesus. Um, what, do you, what is this born again stuff? Jesus was trying to get to the root problem of humanity. I just talked about our government, our technology, and our education system. I mean, I would be asking the same question to Jesus. Jesus, can you overthrow this ungodly government, this ungodly um, nation uh, that does not, um, there's some good here, but there's a lot of unrighteousness. There's still murder here. There's still rape here. There's still poverty here. There's still sexism here. There's still racism here. Can you overthrow it, Lord? And the Lord would be like, ah, that's, not, that's not my time yet. And that's not the root cause of the problem, Keith. The root cause is that man is in darkness and they need to be born again. Man is born with a sinful nature because of Adam and Eve and their disobedience. Sin entered into the human human equation. And, and in that human in equation, sin creates darkness. You now live in a dark world. And guess what? I am the light of the world. And I came, the word was flesh and he, and he dwelt among us. And yet the world did not like Jesus because we love darkness rather than light. And so Jesus tells Nicodemus, you have to be born again or you can never enter the kingdom of God. When I think about the discipleship and Pastor Gary asking a, a very important question, are we really being discipled by our teachers and by our pastors and by our leaders? Are we discipling our kids? Are we really discipling them? Or are we just huddling up, huddling up on a Sunday hearing three sermons, or I mean three songs and a 45 minute sermon, and yet we just go back to our normal lives and we are not the salt of the earth. We are not the light in a dark world. We are not proclaiming the name of Jesus. Are we really doing that? Jesus is getting at the root cause of the problem of humanity. And that is man who was born with a sinful nature. They cannot even see the kingdom of God. They will never see it unless they're born again. Birth is the beginning of life. To be born again is to be made anew. Uh, and when we're born again, we have a new nature. We have new principles, new affections, and new aims. And this birth is not a physical birth. Uh, it is not a human birth. It is a miraculous spiritual birth. It is being born of God. And the beautiful thing is, as we know, as Christians, we have the solution to humanity's problems, to the social ills of this world. Uh, it, it's not going to change unless we proclaim the good news of the gospel that you must be born again. And in this new nature, now we have the problem to be dead to sin. It's not that sin don't live in us, but now we, since we have a new nature, Romans, the book of Romans tell us that we're no longer slaves to sin and we become slaves to righteousness. That's good news. And so when my 23 year old daughter calls me in tears about another death or another shooting or another injustice. I always try to let her understand um, to pray and to be a light. She's saved by the grace of God, and I thank God for that. But I'm always trying to have her rewind the tape back and understand the root cause, that she is a child of God and she shall proclaim the good news. Because once you're born again, you have a new nature and a new spirit, and the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you, and you have the power to defeat sin. And now, you join the body of believers called the church and Christ is the head of that church and he's the chief cornerstone and we're the living stones. And yet he's called us not to just huddle up on a Sunday and hear three songs and a 45 minute message and not make a mark on this dark world that we live in. As I speak more about this dark world, 
turn to First Peter two and nine. It's a beautiful passage. Here's what it says, First Peter two and nine. It says, "But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession." that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Some of those words that I've highlighted, a chosen race or a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Imagine that. It's just not the pastors and the priests that have access to God. Every child of God is a royal priesthood. You know, priests are the people that speak um, to God and speak about God on behalf and speak to, to the people about God. And that's who we are. And then we're his holy nation. We are a holy nation, a peculiar people. And then we're his own possession. Jesus, Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection cost us something cost him something. It cost him his very life, and we are his very own possession. We don't belong to ourselves. We belong to our Heavenly Father, and we should resemble him. And so as we move forward, I look at the practicality of what we should be doing as we are discipled and as we become the community of believers that God has called us to be. Uh, we, God has given us uh, a great, great mission we are to be reconcilers in this dark world. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Uh, it says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing the, their trespasses to them, and has committed us to the word of reconciliation. He also goes on to say this, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. Can you imagine that? The almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful God uses puny men and women like you and I to be his ambassadors to a dark world as if he was pleading through us. And he goes on to say, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In a nutshell, Christ reconciled us to God. A lot of times we like to think about God's attributes and we focus on the great, the good ones, how holy he is and is true and love his loving kindness and his faithfulness. We like to remember his sovereignty and his rule. But one of the things that we don't focus on and is not taught a lot is that there, God is also a God of wrath. God is so holy, he hates sin and lost men men who don't who will not accept Jesus Christ as their savior they will meet the wrath of God one day but yet God is so loving and kind he says in his word he doesn't want any to perish not one person to perish can you imagine that and yet we are his vehicle it says that we are his ambassadors we are the ones that uh now that we know that Christ has reconciled us to God because of his death, burial, and resurrection. And we know that uh, being saved is not by works so that any man can bo boast, but it is by the grace and the will of God himself. We have this good news. We understand the root cause of the ills that plague our world and our society and our country. And yet, if we are being discipled and we don't proclaim this good news to a dark world, uh, then we have lost our light. We have hidden our light. We have uh, lost the flavor, the taste that we should be to a dark world. You see, I looked up the word ambassador, and this is what it says in the Webster Dictionary. An ambassador is an accredited diplomat sent by a country as its official representative to a foreign country. 
It also says it is a person who acts as a representative or a promoter of a specific activity. I like to use that uh, from a spiritual point of view for this message that we are to not only be representatives of God and Christ and character in our new nature. Um, one scholar said it, uh, when he was um, exegeting Matthews 5 and 12, the Beatitudes, I love what he said. Um, uh, I wrote down the quote, it says, the Beatitudes presents a portrait of the ideal citizen in Christ's kingdom. Isn't that an awesome statement? The Beatitudes present a portrait of the ideal citizen in Christ's kingdom. We know that the Beatitudes are, blessed are the poor in spirit, we're not haughty. We understand that we need a savior and we repent of our sins and we fall on our knees. We're not haughty, we don't, we don't have a humanistic viewpoint on the world. Not only are they poor in spirit, but blessed are those who mourn. What are we mourning over as Christians? We not only should mourn over our own personal sin, but we should mourn over the sins of the world. We should mourn that there are people out there that don't know the good news. It also says that the blessed are those who thirst for righteousness. I want to pause there. Blessed are those who thirst for righteousness. Do you know in uh, Psalms 89, when the psalmist was talking about the great and the majestic glory of God, and uh, he also described that the angels were in awe of him, but in, the, and, but in a particular verse, he says, there are two pillars that are the foundation of, of, of God's throne, and that is justice and righteousness. Blessed are those who thirst for righteousness, right living, right thinking, right behavior. And it also says, blessed are those that are merciful. We have to pause there. Christians need to be merciful. We should not gloat over this sinful world or the sinful behavior of people. We should not gloat when a Christian falls from grace. We should not gloat that men are, are, are full of hatred and bigotry and evil. We should mourn. And, and, and be merciful, because without God's mercy, where would we be? Right there in this dark world, right with them. Men love darkness rather than light. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. This is what uh, the portrait of, the citizen of, of, of a citizen of heaven looks like. This is our call. This is our behavior. This is a portrait of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's character. And as I move on, I want to talk, talk about the practicality that we have to remember that we live in a broken, upside down world. A pastor came uh, and spoke at Abundant Life about three years ago. His name was Ephraim Smith. And I'll never forget, he coined the phrase uh, that I fell in love with. And he basically said that when one is born again and is saved, they're now right side up in a broken and upside down world. How true is that? You and I are now right side up, created in God's image for God's own chosen people, created to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood. We understand the real issue of humanity, but we still live in a broken and upside down world. Now we're right side up moving through this life in a broken and upside down world. Well, the beautiful thing of it is that God has called us to be his mission field. And we, it doesn't take, we don't have to go very far to see that there are broken lives all around us and broken relationships, broken systems and institution. The world is desperate for healing and reconciliation. And we are the people who represent the true mind of God and the true will of God. One of the things that I love about discipleship if I was to teach a class on discipleship, I would always remind every single disciple that to have the mind of Christ <clears throat> is to prioritize the will of God. He says, I didn't come to do my will, but your will. Whatever I say, I say what the Father tells me to say. This should be the, the basic found, foundational belief of a disciple. I did not come to do my will, 
but the will of the Father, the one who sent me. I want to wrap this up, but I want to wrap it up with a quick war warning. I want to give a warning to the blunt, to abundant lifers and every other saint who may be listening. You know, God is the same yesterday, yesterday, today, and forever. I talked about Nicodemus being um, born in the ethnic ethnicity of being a Jew and being part of Israel, God's chosen nation and God's chosen people. Look at me with you will in Exodus 19 and five. Under the old covenant, God made the same promises to the nation of Israel. Look what it says. It says, now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me, Israel. You should be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Just sounds familiar like in the new covenant under 1 Peter 2 and 9. And I praise God that Gentiles, you and I are Gentiles, that in the mind of God, before the foundation of the world, he chose us to also be part of his bride and his chosen nation. My Bible study group, we're in the book of Ezekiel, and Exodus 19 makes me wonder what happened to the nation of Israel. And we can see throughout the old covenant, uh, time and time again, what I'm about to say uh, happened over and over again. And what I love about it is uh, the, the mercy and the grace of God always prevailed. It's almost like the blood of Jesus, it will outrun, his grace will outrun any sin. There's nothing that you and I can do that cannot, uh, that the grace of God cannot cover. But what I want to share with you is that from my own point of view, uh, the nation of Israel oftentimes took their eyes off of God and turned their backs on God. The book of Ezekiel is very um, transparent about the anger that God had. And what, what happened was Israel began to even though they knew Jehovah, the one true God, they began to worship the pagan gods of other nations. Think about that for a moment. Let's not judge them. Let's learn from their mistakes, abundant life. They began to worship other gods and take their eyes off of God. When Gary was asking, is the church really discipled? And I had this conversation with not only Elder Arshel, but Elder Carlton as well. And we look back as overseers, like what's going on at Abundant Life? Are our leaders and teachers, are we really discipling people to be effective, highly effective Christians um, in this broken world that we live in? But we have to admit that they took their eyes and they worshiped other idols. They even took other idols into the temple of God. They had idols on every street corner and God's wrath was on them. He was gonna deal with them because God is a jealous God. And I submit to you today that we have idols in our own hearts. Our country can be our idol. Our family can be our idol. Uh, our jobs, uh, being successful can be an idol. How we look can be an idol. Um, anything that has our affections that take us from the will of God can become an idol. And I think we've been too busy playing church and not being the church. So let's examine our hearts. Uh, when, he, when God called Abraham, he called him out of his country and, and away from his family. He said that I will come follow me and I will make you your name great among many nations. Uh, it is so true that discipleship is gonna cost us something. If our country that we live in, no matter what part of the world you live in, if their values do not represent God, your country's allegiance should never take precedent over the word of God and God's will. Your ethnicity, no matter whatever your culture taught you about humanity, um, discrimination, that you're better than other people, that is not the word of God. Your family origin, same thing. Uh, God even says, if your brother, your mother, your sister come against me, you cannot be my disciple if you will take what they want over me. This is what it means that to not be, to be in the world, but not of the world. 
So uh, I leave you with that thought. Um, I pray that this message has blessed you. Let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you for how you're moving in us and through us with these messages to uh, be citizens of your kingdom, to be mindful that we are your disciples and that we are your people. As Pastor Zach mentioned in his sermon, that uh, we are to be the light and the salt of the earth and Sanjay, that heaven, that we're citizens of heaven and that our life is like a vapor. Uh, it appears for a short time and vanishes away. As we move through this earth, Lord, as we move through our country and our community, may we be that salt, may we be that light, may we proclaim the gospel message that salvation comes through you and you alone. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're now going to transition into our time of communion. Uh, and can I just remind us that scripture is clear that the observance of communion is for those who have made a decision to follow Jesus Christ with their whole lives. So if that is not you, if you're watching with us this morning and you have not decided, if you have not um, decided to follow Jesus with your whole life, uh, I would just encourage you to pass on observing communion with us. But I also would say there is no better time than now to make that decision. And so if that is you, if you have questions about what it means to become a Christian or if you'd like to become a Christian, we would love to connect with you about that. And you can reach us at info at alcf.net. And likewise, uh, if you are watching and you need prayer for any reason, it is our great privilege at ALCF to pray for you. And you can reach us at prayer at ALCF with your prayer requests. Uh, when we observe communion, we memorialize Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection on our behalf. And we remember our unity as a body, as his body of believers. So with that, let's just take a moment to quietly prepare our hearts before we take the elements. If you'll take the bread or the cracker or whatever it is that you have. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Take and drink. Now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Until we meet again or until our Savior comes. And then forever. Amen. You are loved, you are prayed for, and you are sent.